Good evening. This is Cynthia from Sin's Crafting World, and welcome to the continuation of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. <clears throat> All right. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip particularly perpendicular in his hand, like a scepter, and as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not like the flapping, not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on top of his nose. <clears throat> for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered about amongst almost to the horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed as they shambled out the gate of Hans Van Ripper, and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with a broad, within broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day, the sky was clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery which, oh, excuse me, we always associate with the idea of abundance. <clears throat> the forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tender kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air. Their bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets. <clears throat> in the fullness of their revelry, they fluttered, chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree, capricious of the very profusion that and uh, variety around them. There was the honest cock robin, the favorite game of stripling sportsmen, with its loud, querulous note, and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds, the gold-winged woodpecker with his crimson crest, his broad black gorget and splendid plumage, and the cedar bird, and its red-tipped wings, and yellow-tipped tail, and its little Monterio cap of feathers, <clears throat> and the blue jay, that noisy coxcomb, in his gay light blue cloak, coat, and white underclothes, streaming and chattering, nodding and bobbing and bowing, and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove. As Ichabod jogged slowly on his way, his eye, ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance, ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn. On all sides he beheld fast stores of apples, some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees, some gathered into baskets and barrels for the market, others heaped up in rich piles for the cedar press. Farther on he beheld great fields of Indian corn, with its golden ears peeping from their leafy coverts, and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding, and the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them, turning up their fair round bellies to the sun, and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies, and anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields breathing the odor of the beehive, and as he beheld them, Soft anticipation stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks, well buttered and garnished with honey or treacle, by the delicate little dimpled hand of Katrina Van Tassel. Thus feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions, he journeyed along the sides of the range of hills which looked out upon some of the godliest scenes of the mighty Hudson. <clears throat> The sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down in the west. The wide bosom of the Tappan Zee lay motionless and glassy, excepting that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow of the distant mountain. 
A few amber clouds floated in the sky without a breath of air to move them. The horizon was of a fine golden tint, changing gradually into a pure apple green, and from that into the deep blue of the mid-haven. A slanting ray lingered on to the woody crest of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river, giving greater depth to the dark grey and purple of their rocky sides. A sloop was loitering in the distance, dropping slowly down with the tide, her sail hanging uselessly against the mast, and as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water, it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in the air. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of the Heer Van Tassel, which he found thronged with pride and flower of the adjacent country. <clears throat> Old farmers, a spare leathern-faced race, in homespun coats and breeches, blue stockings, huge shoes, and magnificent pewter buckles. Their brisk, withered little dames, in close crimped caps, long-waisted short gowns, homespun petticoats, with scissors and pincushions, and gay calico pockets hanging on the outside. Buxom lasses, almost as antiquated as their mothers, excepting wear a, a straw hat, a fine ribbon, or perhaps a white frock, gave symptoms of city innovation. The sons in short square skirt coats, with rows of stupendous brass buttons, and their hair generally cued in the fashion of the times, especially if they could pursue, procure an eel skin for the purpose, it being esteemed throughout the country as a potent nourisher and strengthener of the hair. Brom Bones, however, was a hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed, Daredevil, a creature like himself, full of metal and mischief, and which no one but himself could manage. He was, in fact, noted for preferring vicious animals, given to all kinds of tricks, which kept the rider in constant risk of his neck, for he held a trackable, well-broken horse as unworthy of a lad of spirit. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> Fain would I pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the entraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of Van Tassel's mansion. None those of the bevy of buxom, la buxom lasses with their luxurious display of red and white, but ample charms of a genuine Dutch country tea table in the sumptuous time of autumn. Such heaped up platters of cakes of various and almost irresistible ear indescribable kinds <clears throat> known only to experienced Dutch housewives. There was a doughty doughnut, the tender oily coke, and the crisp crumbling cruller, sweet cakes and short cakes, and ginger cakes and honey cakes, and the whole family of cakes. And then there were apple pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies besides slices of ham and smoked beef, and more delectable shad of roasted chickens, together with bowls of milk and cream, all mingled higgledy-piggledy pretty much as I have enumerated them, with the motherly, motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the midst. Heaven bless the mark! <clears throat> I want breath and time to discuss this ban banquet as it deserves, and am too eager to get on with my story. Happily, I Ichabod Crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian, but did ample justice to every dainty. He was a kind and thankful creature, whose heart dilated on proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer, and whose spirits rose with eating, as some men's do with drink. He could not help, too, rolling his large eyes around him as he ate, and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor. <clears throat> 
Then he thought how soon he'd turn his back upon the old schoolhouse, snap his fingers in the face of Hans Van Ripper and every other niggardly patron, and kick the any itinerant pedagogue out the doors that should dare to call him comrade. <clears throat> Old Baltus Van Tassel moved am about among his guests, with a face dilated with content and good humour, round and jolly as the harvest moon. His hospitable attentions were brief but expressive, being confident to shake a of the hand, a slap on the shoulder, a loud laugh, and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves. <clears throat> And now the sound of the music from the common room or hall summoned to the dance. The musician was an old gray-headed negro who had been the itinerant orchestra of the neighborhood for more than half a century. His instrument was old and battered as himself. The greater part of the time he scraped on two or three strings, accompanying every movement of the bow with the motion of the head, bowing almost to the ground and stamping with his foot whenever a fresh couple were to start. <clears throat> Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fibre about him was idle, and to have seen him loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room, you would have thought St. Vitus himself, that blessed patron of the dance, was figuring you before you in person. He was the admiration of all the Negroes, who, having gathered of all ages and sizes from the farm and the neighborhood, stood forming a pyramid of shining black faces at every door and window, gazing with delight at the scene, rolling their white eyeballs and showing grinning rows of ivory from ear to ear. How could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous? <clears throat> The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings, while Brom Bones, snor sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in one corner. When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the Sager folks, who, with old Van Tassel, sat smoking at one end of the piazza, gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war. This neighborhood, at the time of which I am speaking, was one of those highly favored places which abound with chronicle and great men. The British and American line had run near it during the war. It had, therefore, been the scene of maraud marauding and infested with refuge, cowboys, and all kinds of border chivalry. Excuse me. Just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each storyteller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction, and in the indistinctiveness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit. There was the story of Dofu Martling, a large blue-bearded Dutchman, who had nearly taken a British frigate with an old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork, only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge. And there was an old gentleman who shall be nameless, being too rich a mine here to be lightly mentioned, who in the Battle of the White Plains, being an excellent master of defense, parried a musket ball with a small sword, insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz around the blade and glance off at a hilt, in proof of which they, he was already at any time to show the sword with the hilt and a little bent. There were several more that had been equally great in the field, not of whom but was persuaded that he had considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination. <coughs> but all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered, long-settled retreats, but are trampled upon underfoot 
by the shifting throng that forms the population of most of our country places. Besides, there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages, for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves in their graves before their surviving friends have traveled away from the neighborhood, so that when they turn out at, to walk at night their rounds, they have no acquaintance left to call upon. This is perhaps the reason why we seldom hear of ghosts, except in our long-established Dutch communities. The immediate cause, however, of the prevalence of supernatural stories in these parts was doubtless owing to the vicinity of Sleepy Hollow. There was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region. It breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies infecting all the land. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were pre present at Van Tassel's and, as usual, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains, and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken, and which stood in the neighborhood. Some mention was made also of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen of Raven Rock and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. <clears throat> the chief part of the stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of S Sleepy Hollow, the headless horseman, who had been heard several times of late, patrolling the country, and, it is said, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. The sequestered situation of this church seems always to have made it a favorite haunt for troubled spirits. It stands on a knoll surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms, from among which its descent whitewashed walls shine modestly forth, like Christian purity beaming through the, through the shades of retirement. A gentle slope descended from, descends from it to a silver sheet of water, bordered by high trees between which peeps may be caught at the blue hills of the Hudson. It look, <clears throat> it look up to look upon its grassy grown yard there where the sunbeams seem so quick sleep to seem to, sorry, where the sunbeams seem to sleep so quietly. One would think that there at least the dead of night, the dead might rest in peace. On one side of the church extends a wide woody dell, along which raves a large brook among the broken rocks and trunks of fallen leaves. Over a deep black part of the stream, not far from the church, was formerly thrown a wooden bridge. The road that led to it, and the bridge itself, were thickly shaded by overhanging trees which cast a gloom about it, even in the daytime but occasioned a fearful darkness at night. Such was one of the favorite haunts of the headless horseman, and the place where he was most frequently encountered. The tale was told of Bower, a most heterical disbeliever in ghosts, how he met the horseman returning from his foray in Sleepy Hollow, and was obliged to get up behind him how they galloped over bush and brake, over hill and swamp, until they reached the bridge, when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw an old bower into the brook, and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. This story was immediately matched by the thrice marvelous adventure of Brom Bones, who made light of the galloping Hessian as an errant, errant, as an errant jockey. He affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village of Sing Sing, he had been overtaken by his midnight trooper, that he had offered to race with him for a bowl of punch, and should have won it too, for Daredevil beat the goblin horse out hollow. But just as they came to the church bridge, the Hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. <clears throat> All these tales told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark, the countenance of the listeners only now and then receiving a casual gleam, casual gleam from the glare of a pipe, sank deep in the mind of Ichabod.
he repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author, Cotton Mather, and added many marvelous events that had taken place in his native state of Connecticut and fearful sightings which he had seen in his nightly walks about Sleepy Hollow. To revel now gradually broke up. The old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons and were, and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills. Some of the damsels mounted on pillions behind their favorite swains and their light-hearted laughter mingling with the cl uh, clatter of hoofs echoed along the silent woodland sounding fainter and fainter and they, until they gradually died away, and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted. Ichabod only lingered behind, according to the custom of country lovers, to have a tete-a-tete -tete with the Harris, fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success. What passed at this interview, I will not pretend to say, for, in fact, I do not know. Something, however, I fear me, must have gone wrong, for he certainly sallied forth, and no very great interval, with an air quite desolate of chap fallen. Oh, those women, these women! Could that girl have been playing off any of her co coquettish tricks? Was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival? Heaven only knows, not I. Let it suffice to say, Ichabod stole forth with the air of one who had been sacking a hen roost rather than a fair lady's heart. Without looking to the right or left to notice the scene of r rural wealth on which he had so often gloated, he went straight to the stable, and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused the steed almost uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping, dreaming of mountains of corn and oats and whole valleys of timothy and clover. It was the very witching time of the night that Ichabod, heavy-hearted and crestfallen, pursued his travels homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above Tarrytown, and which she had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon. The hour was as dismal as himself. Far below him, the trapping sea spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters, where here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor under the land. <clears throat> in the dead hush of midnight, he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the Hudson, but it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea for of distance from this faithful companion of man. Now and then, too, the long-drawn crowing of the cock accidentally awakened would sound far, far off from some farmhouse away among the hills. But it was like a dreaming sound in his ear. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or her, perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from the neighboring marsh, as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky, and driving clouds occasionally hit them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous tulip tree, which towered like a giant above all other trees of the neighborhood and formed a kind of landmark. Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic, large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees, twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air. It was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate Andre, who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of the Major Andre's tree. The common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition, 
partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake, and partly from the tales of the strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it. As Ichabod approached this fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches. As he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree. He paused and ceased whistling, but, on looking more narrowly, perceived that it was a place where he had been scattered, scathed by lightning, and the white wood laid bare. Suddenly he heard a groan. His teeth chattered. His knees smote against the saddle. It was but the rubbing of one of the huge bow upon another, as they were swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety, but new perils lay before him. And that is where we leave off for tonight. Have a good sleep, everyone. Good night.